About 4,000 years ago, evil beings wanted to rule Earth and spread chaos everywhere. Only one person stood between them, who was not an ordinary human, but one of the most powerful mages in the world. He was the strongest nine-star mage named Lucas Trauman. He proved that humans weren't as weak as those evil beings thought when he stood victorious on the battlefield. That's when he saw a long robe and a hood that hid most of his face except for the laser beam eyes. He was the demigod, the boss who had come to intervene. But the demigod had decided that his actions disturbed the long-standing order and laws of the world, and he wouldn't tolerate it anymore. Lucas laughed it off as a joke. What good was order and law in the world where evil things crawled around? The demigod didn't care what he thought since he was a mere human. Even if his skills and power had surpassed everything, he needed to be shown his real place. He had committed the deadliest sin in the universe, which was the sin of opposing God, and a deadly sin deserves a deadly punishment, which made the demigod condemn him to the eternal abyss where he would start doubting his own existence. We are back to the present day in a small room at a reputable academy where one trainee is being bullied by his peers. The bullies walk away as the young trainee fists his hands, wishing that he was stronger. Lucas hears the trainee's wish as a whisper in the abyss where he is still stuck. He has been here for 4,000 years and it's about time he lost his mind. Lucas wonders how many years it has been since he was thrown here since you tend to lose the sense of time in an existence like this. Back on Earth. Frey Blake, the bullied trainee, had just heard the worst news of his life. His father wants him to disappear completely because he brings dishonor to the family name. Frey is dumbstruck. Is being weak such a big sin? In his room, Frey stares at the bottle of pills while seriously considering suicide. The idea of death rightfully terrifies him. In the abyss, Lucas decides that he will not give up and he will endure this hellish place just to punch the demigod's face in the end. Meanwhile, Frey has taken the pills and given up on life. However, he doesn't know that he has entered Lucas's consciousness. He goes to Frey and touches his head while he whispers that he wants to be powerful when he is reborn. The next instant, Lucas stands in Frey's room looking exactly like Frey. He is finally back after 4,000 years as Frey Blake, the world's weakest human. He promises Frey to give him wings since he gave him his freedom. He opens the window of his room and points at the sky, swearing to take his revenge from the demigod who took away 4,000 years from him. Lucas and Frey's body is practicing his magic in the middle of the night as he needs to recover all his original strength to fight the demigod. He practices whatever he can the whole night and throws up and realizes that he needs to get rid of all the impurities that have built up in Frey's body. His first order of business is to vomit it all out, so he starts vomiting and keeps doing it for the rest of the morning. At West Road Academy, the bullies David and Jack are waiting to beat up Frey, who they take a bet about how likely it is that he actually does commit suicide. Apparently, they don't care about who lives or dies as long as they are entertained. This whole while, Lucas has vomited his guts out. How did a young boy's body store this much filth? At the West Road Canteen, Lucas makes all heads turn by eating like he has starved for weeks. It isn't true, of course. In reality, he hasn't eaten anything for 4,000 years. When he enters the classroom, David and Jack find out the results of the bet they had taken. Apparently, Frey can't even commit suicide properly. Jack arrives there, telling Lucas to reimburse him for losing the bet. Lucas doesn't think he can be Frey's friend. He clearly looks like a bully who has nothing better to do. Lucas doesn't get why anyone would be afraid of a dimwit like Jack. Lucas finally has enough of him and he hits him with one of the magic tricks that are always up his sleeves. Everyone else in the classroom can't believe their eyes. Is this actually Frey who has finally decided to fight back? Jack tries to hit him again as he needs to save face. However, Lucas is too quick for him to be blasting him off to the far end of the room. He has finally deduced that these are the people who made Frey try to take his own life. 
Meanwhile, Professor Dio arrives to examine the scene of crime. He goes over to Jack and discovers the traces of martial skills used with mana. This is no ordinary feigning incident. The class continues with Professor Kevin stepping back in to cover Professor Dio, who has taken Jack to the medical room. Seems like Jack will be back to normal by this evening. He goes over to Frey since he is shocked that he is taking his classes. This makes Lucas upset. Clearly, he thought that Frey is a good kid who studies properly. We go back 4,000 years in the middle of the mountains, where Kassajin is practicing his mana. Lucas arrives there and it turns out that they haven't seen each other in a long time. Lucas isn't pleased that his friend is still training while he has to sit there and wait for him. How is he ever going to get married if he keeps training all the time? But it looks like Kassajin has no intentions of ever letting a woman enter his life. Back to the present time, Lucas and Frey's body has found out that his old friend is known as Great Warrior King Kassajin. He has made a name for himself in the history books, which makes him feel proud. Professor Kevin is waiting for Frey to answer his questions regarding the topic studied in class when Isabel interrupts coming to his rescue. Isabel refuses Professor Kevin's advances, asking her to come to his laboratory, which angers him. He diverts his attention and asks her a question about the items used by Cassigen, which is answered by Frey from up front. The professor doesn't care and grabs Isabel's hand to take her to his laboratory since she has been disrespectful. Lucas isn't going to sit by and taunts him, making him enraged even further. He comes back to him, telling him that he needs to answer all of his questions correctly or he will be in big trouble at the academy. This is surely a fun way to teach, professor. Lucas sits smugly as he has answered all of the professor's questions correctly. Surely this is a mistake, because when did Frey Blake become a genius, and when did he memorize the history of the Light Ages? Lucas is saved from a further quiz session by the lunch bell. He is walking towards the canteen, dreaming about all the food he is about to eat when Isabel catches up to him. They sit down at the canteen, and Isabel is amazed to see all the food that Lucas is about to eat. How is he going to fit all this food into his stomach? Isabel seems to know much about the Light Era as well, especially about the strongest mage called Lucas Trauman. She has a crush on him and probably would have married him if she wasn't aware that he died thousands of years ago. Lucas can't control his laughter at this little kid who's thinking about marriage when she hasn't even grown up and refuses her marriage proposal. The rest of the school can't believe that Isabel is having lunch with Frey. They all think that she is too proud as she ranks as the Academy's top two. And she's the one who rejects everyone who chases her, including the infamous David. David is clearly not happy after overhearing this conversation. On the other hand, Isabel wants Lucas to teach her the battling method he mentioned in class earlier. He dodges her request, preparing to leave, but Isabel needs to get her answers first. He tells her that his knowledge is just experience and she needs to read books if she wants to learn the normal way. It's the practical training session at the academy where only one-star magic spells are tolerated and trainees should expect real battle experience. Lucas finds the professor gorgeous and Isabel loses her mind because she's in her 40s. That's fine since Lucas is in his early thousands as well. Of course, even his taste in women is old. The first match is between David and Frey, and both of them walk on the stage. Lucas walks right past, towards the gorgeous professor. He makes a bet, saying that she has to come on a date with him if he wins the match. She agrees to the bet, motivating him to win this match anyhow. The match begins, and David uses the Stone Rage spell, casting stones all over the ground. Lucas finds it childish that David is using this spell to bully people and cast some magic missile spell. Is he really going to fight Stone Rage with this spell? Since this is the only spell that Frey can use, Lucas uses it to cut down all of the stones created by David's spell and hits him with all of his force that causes him to fall down helplessly on his back. Lucas stands there in all his victory, while David can do nothing but weep. How did weak Frey beat him so easily? David's vocal cords are gone, and Lucas is all ready to destroy his limbs. Of course, he won't break the limbs all over his body, only his legs will do for now. Lucas suddenly gains popularity all over the school for beating David, 
is approached by a fourth-year trainee in the corridor named Dowman who asks him to join in the Trauman Rings, which is the assembly of trainees that represent West Road Academy. Lucas can't get over the fact that this assembly is named after him. Is it an invasion of privacy if they use his name without permission? As Dowman is ranting about the awesomeness of the Trauman Rings, Lucas rejects his proposal. At this moment, the manager of the assembly, Parowan June, arrives. Parowan invites Frey to join the Trauman Rings as well. However, Lucas has made up his mind and refuses, and allows them to use his name and have fun. This angers Dalman while Parowan has a poker face on. Lucas's date night with Professor Jane includes Isabel as the third wheel, which Lucas is not happy about. She has apparently decided to follow him around until he agrees to teach her the battling method. Later that night, Lucas is standing alone thinking about Demigod, when Isabel follows him here as well. He asks her about the Academy's honcho, which is the childish word for the most powerful person. He promises to tell her about battling if she answers his question, which makes her excited. She tells him that Perowen is the strongest among the trainees, and Professor Dio and Adelie are the strongest amongst the professors. However, she reveals that her aunt, West Road Academy's director, Lady Cyrus, is the strongest of them all. Professor Jane interrupts by saying that Lady Cyrus is a six-star mage, and Lucas decides that he needs to meet this Lady Cyrus. Two weeks later, David comes back to school in bandages and crutches ready to pick a fight with Frey. There's no way he lost against Frey the weakling. He finds him and starts to threaten him when Lucas launches another one of his magic missiles and hits David, breaking his nose. He is sent back to his family, not to be seen again for a few more weeks, which is good news for the entire academy. Lucas thinks that he needs more practical experience to get used to handling mana in Frey's body, and his prayers are answered when Alex drags him into another room. He is upset about what Lucas has done to his best buddy David. Lucas doesn't understand if he's being bullied and keeps yawning while Alex keeps going on to sing his own praises while threatening him with his friends. Lucas has enough of his empty threats and casts the magic missile spell which injures Alex and a few of his friends. The rest of the goons do not appreciate the disrespect. However, Lucas doesn't have time for them and defeats them in a matter of seconds. The next day in class, Lucas invites Isabel to come for training with him so he can show her what battling is. She is over the moon and agrees instantly. On a brand new morning, Isabel arrives to meet Lucas with heavy luggage. Are they going on holiday that nobody knows about? Lucas is just as surprised as anyone because clearly they are not going camping. Alas, he wouldn't understand the need for so many bags as a girl needs a million things with her at all times. Lucas wants to head over to the Ipsanya Mountains, which are so dangerous that they are called the paradise for monsters. They look at the mages, they look at the maps and make all the necessary plans. No matter how dangerous the road is, Isabel has come prepared. Lucas discovers that even though magecraft has stayed the same, technology has improved in this new age. Maybe that's why mages today are so lazy. They have to buy the warp stones for the journey, which is too expensive for Lucas who only has one gold coin in his pocket. Frey is penniless because he has been disowned by his family and all of his money was stolen by the bullies. Isabel isn't ready to contribute her own money as she plays by the rules and they have to, and they have to earn their own money for travel expenses for training. Lucas is frustrated to find out that she doesn't have a single penny in any one of the bags she's carrying. They reach the ship that they are about to travel on, and Lucas can't contain himself when he finds out that it is free of cost for the academy trainees. He has started drooling just thinking about all the food he can get on the ship. His dreams are shattered when he is told that the ship is full, and their next best option is the one next to it named Corteso that doesn't look as luxurious as this one. Fate may be working against his love for food. Meanwhile, a group of pirates are planning to loot the Corteso, and they have found out that all the rich kids are traveling on it. On the other hand, Lucas and Isabel board the ship and meet the captain, who reveals that the ship has two warships and a four-star mage ready to protect everyone from the pirates that tend to show up on their route. Just when the captain claims that the pirates would never dare to show their face there, a pirate ship arrives and both the warships have been sunk. A few moments before the attack, 
The pirates had spotted the warships escorting the Cortezo. What are they going to do about them? Well, it's their special guest, Lord Dullard's problem, who is an undying being and looks like a skeleton. Lord Dullard manages to sink the warships with a few strokes of his ice spears, which delights all the pirates aboard. Their raid has become much easier. The skeleton man is confused since he has cast three ice spears and the third ship is still afloat for some reason. There is something on that ship that has protected it from the ice spears and he needs to find out what it is. On Corteso, a state of chaos has begun with everyone running around to save themselves, while one hooded figure is sitting in the corner calmly. The pirates have come aboard ready to loot the ship and take the relatives of the rich families as hostages. The pirates spot a spectacled trainee to use who gets so scared that he soils his pants. One of the pirate goons throws the trainee in the sea where he drowns, which enrages the rest of the trainees. They can't let this happen to his two-star mage and start casting their own spells directed at the pirate captain. However, he is under the skeleton lord's protection and none of the spells touch him. Lord Dullard has personally arrived on the ship to scare everyone and Isabel is alarmed to see him. These pirates have actually made a deal with the dead, which makes them totally insane since undying beings are great at manipulating everything. The undead lord wants the person who blocked his magic to come out and vows to kill everyone on board if he doesn't show himself. His ice spears are ready to attack until the hooded figure steps forward and confesses that he is the one who stopped his magic. He reveals his face and it is revealed to be Purawan Jun. Isabel clearly knows Purawan who is the leader of the Trauman Rings and belongs to an influential house of the Empire. Pirawan is not only a celebrity amongst the trainees, but a common savior because everyone has started to celebrate with this revelation. However, Lucas doesn't think that Pirawan can save the day since he is facing off against Lord Skeleton who is at least a 5 star, and it's a miracle that Pirawan is still alive after canceling his magic. However, Lucas is really impressed with his ability to negotiate and decides that the country's future is indeed bright. Lord Dullard refuses his order on the spot since he wants to taste Parowan's mana, absorb it to the last drop. He has taken Parowan as his personal hostage, tying him up so he doesn't escape. The Skeleton Lord has thought this plan out fully. The pirates start harassing every passenger on the ship until one of the goons spots the cute Isabel who is starting to hold Lucas tightly, making him feel even hotter. Lucas is obviously not going to sit by and let it happen easily, and he's certainly not going to let this pirate disrespect him, so he refuses to step aside. The one-eyed pirate is about to cut Lucas's head off, and the next instant he falls off the ship after Lucas kicks him with all his power. Parowan is impressed with Lucas's speed and skill, and can't believe that Frey has so much power in a single kick. Lucas moves on to another target, punching and kicking another pirate that makes him bleed. He thinks that they should have taken Pirouan's offer since he won't show any kindness or mercy to them. Hearing this triggers the rest of the pirates who charge to attack him with knives and Lucas deals with all of them at once. Kicking, punching and using the magic missile on them to throw them overboard or send them flying to the other end of the ship. The rest of the trainees and the pirates look at him with their mouths open, not knowing where he has found so much courage and style with his skills. The pirates have surrounded him once again without learning a lesson and Lucas's magic missiles deal with all of them, not giving them the chance to get up on their two feet and finally makes them disappear in a puff of smoke. One of the more senseless pirates threatens Isabel's life to make him stop and she uses the lightning strike spell to strike him on the spot as he falls to the ground. This kid is not as cute and innocent as she looks after all. The pirate captain applauds Lucas's performance and agrees that he is not an ordinary man. He offers to take half of the trainees as hostages as a peace offering. Every trainee starts offering him money in exchange for saving them and he starts to seriously consider it since he doesn't have any money for travel expenses. While Isabel advises him against it, he starts taking bids from the trainees in exchange for their lives, enraging her even further. After hearing them out, Lucas isn't impressed with them throwing their parents' money in his face. This is not how a good maid should act. 
and he starts lecturing them on the attributes of mages. His inner traditionalist can never die, can he? However, money over tradition is the easiest choice, so he starts taking bids again. The skeleton lord steps forward to threaten Lucas, who thinks that he talks just like the demigod. Lord Dullard casts the living missile spell, and the danger is real since the missiles have a tracking spell on them and they will follow him wherever he goes. Dullard casts another spell, making skeleton hands come out of the floor of the ship trying to attack Lucas and looks like one of the bony's hands got him as he disappears behind a cloud of smoke. Isabel makes the cloud of smoke disappear and starts calling out to Frey who is nowhere to be seen. Where can he be? Is he even alive? The tracker missiles move around and target Lord Dullard instead, who turns them off but wonders about the reason behind their change of direction and this is when Frey appears behind the skeleton figure. Apparently, his bone structure looks prettier since no one can see his face from this angle. Meanwhile, the skeleton lord has launched his destructive ice spear spell to destroy the ship and save himself. However, the spears are stopped by a magical barrier around the ship and Lucas is revealed to be casting a protective barrier spell. Is there anything he cannot do? Lord Dullard has enough of this lowly human and casts another ice spear that is stopped by Lucas with a single punch and he stands face to face with the skeleton lord where Lucas reveals his real identity. Dullard isn't ready to believe it and Lucas is not going to waste his time trying to prove his truth. So he reaches through his chest and pulls out his heart and kills this like lord. Aren't undying beings supposed to not die? Lucas's next target is the Pirate Lord, who is scared out of his mind, trying to ignore the same fate as Dullard. All the pirates are dead on the ship and the supposed pirate raid is officially over as Lucas stands above the corpses while all the trainees look at him. The ship has reached its destination by the morning where Perowen compliments Lucas's magic skills and thanks him for saving his life. The trio is walking along the streets when Pirouin asks him all the questions regarding his newfound talent and Lucas answers these questions without revealing his truth. They receive an invite from him to visit the Jun house and Lucas turns it down. He takes this opportunity to ask Pirouin to lend him some money which angers Isabel even more. Can't he behave like a normal magician? Parowan generously gives him 300 gold without a payback requirement, which makes Lucas like him even better. He asks Parowan to set him up with his fiancée's sister or aunt, which is inappropriate and amusing at the same time. Lucas and Parowan seem to be friends already. They part ways with Parowan and continue their journey with Lucas complimenting Parowan's deep pockets while mocking Isabel for being penniless. Isabel is showing her outfit options to Lucas who tells her to go home if she is thinking about training in the mountains in fluttery clothes. She chooses light clothes eventually, but her girly heart gets excited to be surrounded by fancy clothes. They reach at the warp stone and Lucas finds the improved version much better than the one that existed during his time. They arrive at España and Lucas finds that this place has not changed even after 4,000 years. The duo is at the restaurant where Lucas needs a beer, however he isn't aware that he is a minor and thus it's illegal for him to drink alcohol. The legalities don't matter since it was normal for 13 year olds even to drink beer during his time. The owner of the restaurant brings them their food and mocks them for thinking that newbies like them can survive the mountains. The old man tells Isabel that his son died in the España mountains, urging them not to go to the mountains since it is a living hell. He gives them all the information they need and wishes them well for their journey, promising to make better sausages if and when they return from their deadly journey. Isabel and Lucas have barely entered the mountains when strong monsters come pouring out from the forest. They fight off the first group of these monsters, but this is just the beginning. How many more do they have to face? Lucas tells her that they are not only here to train, but Schweitzer's dungeon is their real destination, which is rumored to give a person all the strength to rule the world. This dungeon can easily be a legend, but does it actually exist? Their first order of business is to find a safe place to train, and they finally find it in a cave hidden behind a waterfall the next day. He finally is about to show her the battling method after a fair warning that this technique is too dangerous. After telling her to observe, 
He sits down in a yoga position and starts absorbing mana from the whole Espana Mountains. He is impressed to see Isabel trying to do the same and being fairly good at it. Maybe bringing her wasn't a total mistake. Lucas brings out his magic bag as it's dinner time and tells Isabel to eat her food even if she has to force it down her throat. He does get extreme sometimes, doesn't he? As they sit eating their food, Isabel tells him that he feels like a different person whose spirit she got drawn to and thanks him for changing as he would have never brought her to train if he remained the same fray. She feels displeased after Lucas shows his lack of interest in her in a romantic way. He is not attracted to kids and especially those who are thousands of years younger than him. The next day, the real training begins where Lucas separates the mana gathered in his body into water and fire attributes that are fighting to keep each other in check. He has to match the balance to stabilize the mana, doing it perfectly. Isabel tries to do the same and ends up vomiting blood. How is he doing such an intense and painful method as if he is meditating? He must be feeling all of the pain too, but it doesn't look like anything's bothering him. Two weeks have passed since they arrived at the cave, and Lucas hasn't moved an inch the entire time. He couldn't have missed a single meal during this time, could he? It is shocking that he has almost become a six star already, as Isabel has never seen such fast growth speed. She sits down to train alongside him when a phoenix, which is considered as a divine beast, interrupts their session. He moves over to the phoenix, touching its feathers, it has come there to ask for help, as he shows her that it almost had its heart taken out. It's a miracle that the magical creature is still alive. This makes Lucas wonder about the kind of dangers lurking in these mountains that have attacked and inflicted such a deep wound on this divine beast. Looks like the phoenix has fought against a deadly opponent, and Lucas offers to help it. Isabel is amazed to see the creature behaving like a little pet in front of him. The flashback from 4,000 years ago shows Lucas in his real body standing in front of a phoenix in the middle of the rain on top of the same waterfall. He took a bet with that phoenix, challenging him to a race for food. In the present time, Lucas feels nostalgic as this phoenix reminds him of his old friend. He heals the phoenix and advises him to choose his opponents wisely before he flies away. They find its feather on the floor of the cave that it left as a sign of gratitude. Looks like it now knows how to pay its debts, unlike Isabel, who is of no use to him. Maybe he should start talking to humans nicely as well. Four weeks have passed and Lucas has gone weak after meditating for the past week and not eating a single meal. How has he kept his uncontrollable hunger in check for so long? Lucas has finally reached his goal and become a six-star mage, and he can gather his mana by just breathing. However, his body's a mess due to starvation and he needs some oily food in his stomach. They go out to hunt and find numerous monsters dead in their path, so the phoenix has been protecting them from these monsters. They really do repay their debts. They hear a human's voice not far from where they are and put their dinner plans on hold. Lucas uses his speed to run to the voice, leaving Isabel alone who doesn't know what to do. On the other hand, some people are being brutally tortured by a few bandits. They have made a game out of it and are taking turns throwing knives at a man tied to a tree. Apparently, they have been waiting for a woman to pass by them for over a month. One of the bandits throws a knife at the man again as a 10-point hit when it's stopped by Lucas who doesn't appreciate them using innocent humans as targets. He uses his newly achieved five-star magic to fight off these bandits with single hits, and he clearly looks ready to teach them a lesson on ethics and morality. Isabel arrives on the scene to find all the bandits dead and Lucas standing over their corpses. In his defense, he did let one of them escape with, of course, tracking magic on him, but he doesn't need to tell her this. He wants to find their captain and wonders if the demigod enjoys watching humans kill each other, wanting to mess up his entertainment. The man tied to the tree begs him to save his life as he wants to apologize to his father, which catches Lucas's attention. The scene shifts to the one escaped bandit bringing the news of the death of their third platoon to their captain. According to him, a white-haired ghost murdered all of them. The captain deduces that the murderer is a magician who is too powerful for his own good. 
The captain orders all of them to kill this ghost wherever he is spotted, and his thoughts are put on hold by the arrival of Sonia Aquareed, the eldest daughter of the Aquareed Nighthouse with her fighters. Sonia stands alone in front of the bandits after cutting down most of them with her sword. Looks like she's a great warrior, but what can she do alone against a large group of bandits? 